So, Dan, it is great to have you on this call today. Thanks, Karen. And, Dan, I want to talk about the big elephant. Everybody's talking about this in the room, HARP 2.0. Can you give me a little history of, uh, about it? It, it, in, you know, it was introduced a couple of years ago, and then it was enhanced this time around. So a little background, please. You bet. You know, it's funny. When I was looking back at some of our notes, we first started writing about HARP back in February of 2009. Now, it's hard to believe that it's almost three years ago that the very first version of this program came out. When HARP was originally introduced uh, the first time back then, the program was substantially different than what it is now. Uh, throughout the course of the last three years, we've seen a number of changes to the HARP program, subtle little tweaks and adjustments over the course of that three-year period where the program has gotten a little bit better pretty much every time. I think what they try to do is they try to adjust it to make it easier for more people to qualify. And I think with HARP 2.0, you know, there certainly was a lot of hype over HARP uh, 2.0. Uh, I'm not sure that it's quite going to live up to the, the amount of hype that we've seen out there. I do think there's going to be some borrowers that certainly will benefit and you know, make it easier for some of our uh, listeners in, in different market areas to get some deals done that they may not have been able to do before. But there's certainly a, a lot of hype. But once we start going through some of the details, you can start to see where the improvements are there, but they may not be all that. Uh, but the flip side is you are going to find an opportunity to get some additional deals done that you wouldn't have been able to do before. Uh, originally, the program started with a cap of 105% LTV back in uh, the early 2009, and then it subtly changed to 125%. Uh, I want to say it was probably late summer of 2009. It was really stuck at that maximum 125% LTV up until recently with the changes uh, with HARP 2. Uh, but there's been a lot of changes over that time frame. Uh, the PMI companies have kind of evolved and changed with the program as well, where I think uh, you know the changes that we do see now are good changes. Uh, I'm not sure that they're going to help us get that many more loans done than what we were doing previously. Part of it, too, of course, you know, the, the, the program was meant to, to help homeowners to refinance who were underwater uh, or to make that process easier so that they could save some money. Of course, that money that they save as part of the refinance process uh, ideally makes it easier to, to continue to live life for our homeowners. And in all honesty, hopefully, uh, you know, take some of those savings and push them back into the economy. So all in all, you know, we're, we're going to cover a lot of ground here uh, in, in a relatively quick period of time, uh, but that's just some of the background. It's about a three-year-old program that, you know, truth be told, I personally have done uh, hundreds of these loans and have had a lot of clients that have benefited from the HARP program. So let me go ahead and kick this off with, with a series of questions here. So, Dan, what are the main differences between being a current servicer of the loan right now and a new servicer. And by the way, some of these questions were posted on our Facebook page, uh, mortgagecurrency.com. Uh, and if you have a chance, please uh, feel free to like it on Facebook. So, one of the biggest differences between being a current servicer of the loan versus a new servicer really comes down to how the loan is processed. For those that are currently servicing the loan, you get reduced documentation requirements, meaning that it is quicker and easier to put that deal together, and it's a simpler process. In addition, probably one of the biggest changes with the expansion in LTVs as part of HARP 2, loans where you are the current servicer were eligible for the greater than 125 LTV with application dates as of December 1, where if you're not the current servicer, you really cannot take and close a loan that has an LTV greater than 125% until Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac update their scorecards, which is going to happen here in March of 2012. That's probably one of the biggest differences as part of HARP 2 is current servicers got a head start on high LTV loans. Aside from that, the other difference, of course, is reduced documentation. You're not required to document as much as part of a loan process if you currently service that loan, which makes the process much simpler and, truth be told, gives you an advantage in being able to close the loan that much faster. So, so basically the main reason for the March 2012 is computer updates? Essentially, yeah. Uh, there's going to be an update to both DU and LP 
the update to DU and LP is meant to give you uh, more loans that are approvable or, or more loans that are eligible, if you will. In other words, the intention is the scorecard for HARP eligible loans will hopefully get a little bit easier. And the other thing you'll do, they intend to make the appraisal waiver requirements easier, meaning more properties will be eligible for an appraisal waiver as part of the automated approval process uh, when you run those loans through DU and LP. So, you know, come March of 2012, those changes are ones that will benefit, you know, pretty much everybody out there, uh, but in particular, you folks who don't currently service the loan because for high LTV deals, you really don't have an outlet until come March of 2012 when you can get those loans through the automated system. Um, to give you an idea, I just closed a loan that we currently service where the loan to value is 128%, and it was a Fannie Mae loan. We were able to do the loan, took the application December 1 and closed them in December. Now, when we ran his loan through DU, we got an approved and eligible because of the LTV. But because we are the current servicer of the loan, I didn't have to live by those DU findings. So let's get let's talk about appraisals. What will happen? I mean, there was a lot of questions in regards to will they require an appraisal? Will it be an AVM? Or will appraisals just simply be waived? You're still going to have appraisals in, in most cases. Um, you will see, or at least the, the agencies are saying that they intend to issue more waivers uh, for appraisals through the automated systems. Uh, as far as AVMs, you know, in reading through the different releases and announcements, it's pretty clear that they don't want AVMs to be used uh, unless you're using, you know, what comes with DU or what you get through LP, which is what's called an HVE, or their, their kind of assessment of value. According to what's been released so far, they intend to issue many more appraisal waivers, or the HVE, HVE point system in LP is going to be one where you should be able to avoid an appraisal in many more cases or many more loans. Other than that, you're still going to have the need for appraisals in many cases, so appraisals are not going to go away, and, and I honestly uh, don't think you'll see that that happen at all. Uh, I think where where you'll see the biggest changes is the use of AVMs that are non uh, GSE information or non agency information. I think you're going to see that go away. Uh, I think you'll see more files that will be eligible for an appraisal waiver through the automated system, which will make the process easier, quicker, and faster. But, you know, in all honesty, you know, with the elimination of the LTV limits, uh, what does it matter if you get a low appraisal? You know, because, they're, you mm -hmm. know, if I got, you know, a $200,000 loan on a $100,000 property, they have a 200% LTV, who cares? Mm -hmm. The differences between Fannie and Freddie, I, you know, in looking at those, there are some, and I wouldn't even say subtle differences, there are differences between a, a, Fannie, a Fannie sold loan and a Freddie sold loan. Would you mind going over a Fannie first and then okay. comparing it with Freddie? You know, the one thing that, uh, you know, I sat in on a Fannie Mae conference call, and one of the questions that somebody asked, and I wanted to make sure I cover this for our, our listeners, is can you take a loan that's currently sold to Fannie and sell it to Freddie and vice versa? And, of course, you can't do that. If the loan is currently owned by Fannie Mae, it's got to go back to Fannie Mae. If it's currently owned by Freddie Mac, it's got to go back to Freddie Mac. So you can't take one loan that's held by one agency and sell it to somebody else. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that our, our listeners are aware of that, uh, as that was a question that was asked. And what seems pretty obvious to us, sometimes people may not realize that you can't do that. You know, as far as the, the differences between the two, you know, really what it comes down to uh, and I, I believe this is a general rule of thumb. I think uh, Fannie Mae is probably easier to work with than Freddie. Uh, and I think their program tends to be a little bit easier to work with in most cases. Um, there's some subtle differences in the loan level price adjustments between the two. With the changes to HARP, there's been some changes as part of the loan level price adjustment schedule. Uh, with those changes, uh, there's a subtle difference between Fannie and Freddie where Fannie treats a primary residence slightly different than what Freddie does. And what I mean by that is Freddie says pretty much primary residences and second homes kind of fall into one bucket and an investment property into another bucket, where Fannie says primary residences fall into one bucket and then everything else into another bucket. And that has to do with the elimination 
of some loan level uh, price adjustments that apply. So in that particular case, actually, Freddie is a little more friendlier to deal with, if you will, uh, where Feeney is a little more, I don't want to say greedy, but uh, they're going to make you pay if it's a second home in some cases. So that's one of the subtle differences. Uh, I think you know, the other difference, you know, in all honesty, and this is one that is probably more of a real-life uh, challenge for us as lenders, is in how closing costs are handled. Uh, with Fannie Mae, you can typically roll closing costs into the mortgage, and there really isn't a limit that's, that's applied to how much in cost that you can roll into that deal. In the case with Freddie Mac, there is a limit, and that limit is 4% of the loan amount or $5,000, whichever is the lower of the two. So if you've got a borrower who has, let's just say, a $70,000 loan, you're limited to $2,800 of cost that can be rolled into that mortgage. Well, if that borrower has closing costs, escrows, and stuff like that, you could you could run out of money to roll those closing costs into the loan, which makes it a little bit tougher to get the deal done. That's probably what I would say is probably the, the biggest difference between the two. Uh, I do think that the scorecard uh, that's used by Fannie Mae is probably a little bit easier uh, to work with. I've had some loans that are um, LP, LP deals or Freddie Mac deals where you look at them and you say, oh, wow, I can't believe this isn't going through. Uh, case in point, i got one on my desk right now I'm looking at where the borrower's got a 775 FICO score, uh, LTV of 96, and a, a HC LTV or a combined LTV of 102, and it's getting bounced out. Uh, and it's got debt ratios of 14 and 21. You know, you sit back and say, really? <laughs> you know, these people aren't eligible. Um, so, you know, I think all in all, the scorecard is simply easier to work with uh, with DU than what it is with LP. But I also think that's true in just business as general. Uh, the company I work for, we sell both Freddie and Fannie. And I find uh, typically Fannie scorecard tends to be a little bit easier, at least in my experience. That's what, what's been the case. Uh, but again, biggest difference, I would say, is probably in closing cost. Just recently, Freddie made an update to their TLTV rules in regards to a loan that had a loan-to-value of less than 80% with secondary financing. Previously, their rule made no sense to me, and apparently made no sense to them either because they got rid of the rule. But what, what was in place previously was if your loan-to-value on the mortgage refinancing was 80% or lower and you had a secondary mortgage, the combined loan-to-value of those two liens could not exceed 105%. Uh, this really comes kind of back in line with Fannie Mae in Mears Fannie Mae's policy where there is no combined loan-to-value limit. And now, of course, with the changes to HARP 2, there's no loan-to-value limit either. So this is definitely a move in the right direction. And that brings up another question. I know we had a, a subscriber from the help desk who had a loan, met the delivery deadlines, being sold to Fannie and Freddie, but was still ineligible for HARP. Could you explain that little nuance there also, Dan? You bet. You, you're going to find from time to time that you'll have a borrower who has a loan that, let's say they had a loan that closed in January of 2009. It would be pretty obvious that, gosh, you know, this borrower closed January 2009, we looked them up on the automated system. Uh, it looks like it's owned by Fannie Mae. This should be good to go. shouldn't have any problems. You run them through DU, and you find out that the loan's ineligible for HARP. The reason behind that is both Fannie and Freddie purchased a number of loans where there were negotiated commitments out there. Uh, and what I mean by negotiated commitments, uh, as a lender, we had a number of negotiated exceptions, if you will, with Fannie Mae. And some of those exceptions were ones that were, were very creative, but as part of negotiating that exception, we also agreed to indemnify Fannie Mae against losses that were tied to those loans, or we had a recourse agreement with Fannie as part of those loans. Well, the agencies, of course, have done a good job of making sure they know which loans they've got that kind of recourse or indemnification on, and those loans are loans that typically will show up as ineligible when you try to run them through HARP. You know, to give you an example, you know, our institution does a lot of construction permanent lending. Well, we would sell our construction permanent loans, you know, once they're completed to Fannie Mae under some negotiated variances and in, in some flexibilities we had. Well, one of the challenges with those loans is when those borrowers have come back in to refinance under HARP, in some cases they weren't able to because 
their loan was originally sold to Fannie under one of the variances, and because of that variance we had, there's a certain amount of recourse and identification that our institution has that Fannie says, hey, this loan's not eligible, because ultimately, at the end of the day, if there's a loss tied to that loan, that loss belongs to our institution, not to Fannie. And it's important for our subscribers to realize that every time you refinance one of these deals under HARP, and the borrower is underwater, and and you've got you know far greater risk, let's say, or perceived risk as part of this deal. You know they have to make an accounting adjustment for those loans on their books. So each one of these deals they do, you know, there's there's an accounting you know process in place, if you will, that results in some financial loss to them. So there's not a whole lot of incentive to go refinance or, or allow borrowers to take advantage of HARP where they don't maintain the risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk about the big elephant in the room and the thing that tripped it up last time were PMI insurance, loans that had <laughs> PMI. So could you give us a little background of what that was before when we had PMI insurance and what has changed now, Dan? You know, one of the big things to remember is we have multiple PMI companies out there, and there are a lot of different companies that had a lot of different policies out there. It's important to know who the PMI company is that has the mortgage insurance as part of the deal that you're looking at doing. Now, what happened before, you know, prior to HARP 2, if you will, is each PMI company had their own little set of rules and quirks and so on. And to a certain extent, they still do today. However, many of them are much more uniform now compared to what they used to be. Well, what's happened is, Essentially, all of the PMI companies, again, I think there's one that hasn't changed yet, but from what I'm told, they're in the process of doing it. Uh, all of the PMI companies have gotten rid of that 105% OTV cap. So what that means is if I'm refinancing this other company's loan and my LTV is 118%, I can do that right now. I don't have to wait until March to do that. And in the marketplace I'm in, I've got a lot of deals where that's the case. In all honesty, I've got a lot of borrowers of my own in the past where we've sold the servicing on where they're in that 105 to 125% LTV range where now I can actually help those borrowers. They've, they've driven their guidelines uh, much simpler to try to comply with HARP 2 where it's just much easier to get these deals done. Just make sure that you're looking at the specific PMI vendor for the loan you're working on. If it's, you know, somebody who had insurance through MGIC, make sure you're familiar with MGIC's guidelines. In most cases, they mirror HARP 2 pretty much uh, on the dot, uh, but there can be subtle variances there. So make sure you're looking at those PMI guidelines because they can trip you up in some cases. But in most cases now, most of those PMI vendors are now in line with Freddie and Fannie, uh, you know, where they're, they're pretty much in tune. How do you find out who the PMI company is? Uh, you know, usually you're going to see it on your findings. You know, so a lot of times, you know, they'll identify this loan has mortgage insurance and they'll identify the PMI company. You if know, the company's out of business? Uh, well, you know, that, that's a great question. Uh, we have some companies, RMIC, uh, PMI, uh, that are essentially not writing new policies. However, they are still modifying existing policies that are in force. So, you know, mm -hmm. and we've seen that a couple of times. As a matter of fact, I just saw an email from RMIC within the last couple of weeks here saying that, you know, if it's eligible for HARP 2, we'll modify it. <laughs> you know, their you know, they're, they're guidelines are real simple. If it's eligible, we'll modify it. So, you know, those, those companies that, you know, are no longer with us, those policies still remain intact and in force, and, and they do still modify those. So that, that's a great question, too. All right, let's get to some questions about qualifying. Uh, one of the questions that we had, Dan, was, does Fannie and Freddie require income to be verified? Uh, you, you, have to, you have to verify income depending on a couple different things. Well, let's kind of split it between if you're a current servicer versus you're a new servicer. If you're a new servicer, in other words, you're refinancing somebody else's loan, you're always going to verify employment and income. No exceptions. You're, you're going to have to verify it because you have to run it through the automated system. You've got to document the file according to your, your DU or LP findings. So new servicer, you're pretty much going to verify it no matter what. In regards to documenting income, when you have a manually underwritten loan, 
for Fannie Mae, of course, that would be a refi plus loan. And for uh, Freddie Mac, that would be uh, a relief refinance same servicer loan. In most cases, you have to verify the source of income, but you don't necessarily have to verify the amount of income. Now, the one kind of qualifier to that is if the principal and interest payment is increasing more than 20% from what it is currently, let's just say you have a $1,000 a month P&I payment right now, and now your new P&I payment is going to be $1,205 because the borrower maybe is shortening the term of the loan to pay it off faster. If that's the case, you do have to verify income as well, even though it may be a DU refi plus or an LP or a Freddie Mac uh, relief refi same servicer. So again, this, this rule really applies to folks where you are the current servicer of the mortgage and you're trying to take advantage of some of the reduced documentation. If you have an increase in monthly payment greater than that 20%, you're going to have to verify the income as well as the source of income. You can also expect in many cases you're going to find lenders are probably going to ask you to get a 4506T as well. Now, if you don't hit that 20% increase in payment, like I said, in most cases, you're not going to have to verify the amount of income, but you're still going to have to verify the source of income. Uh, and let me just kind of back the train up here a second and, and, and clarify real quick here. With, with Fannie Mae, if you're the current servicer, their program is what's called a refi plus. In the case of, let's say you're refinancing somebody else's loan, it's what's known as DU refi plus. Refi Plus is a product that you know you can manually underwrite. It does not have to go through the automated underwriting system. DE Refi Plus is one that has to go through the automated underwriting system. So in other words, if you're not the current servicer, you have to run that loan through the automated underwriting system. If you are the current servicer, you have the option of running it through the automated underwriting system if you want to, but you're not required to. And in most cases, if you use Fannie Mae's Refi Plus option, you'll find it's just simpler. You're not required to verify hardly anything. And at the end of the day, it's a very quick and easy loan to get done. Now, Freddie kind of does the same thing. They, have, they call their product the Relief Refinance. You have the Relief Refinance same servicer, meaning that you're, you're refinancing your existing client that you guys currently service, and you have relief refinance, what they call open access, which is where you're refinancing somebody else's customer. The same thing, reduced documentation for the current servicer. The new servicer has to use LP and has to, in many cases, document income assets and so on. Now, if it's one where it is same servicer, the, the subtle difference of Freddie is that that payment's going up more than 20%. Do have to verify income as part of it. Now, one of the differences with Freddie there as well, too, is Freddie does not allow the use of LP, period, for your same servicer or uh, relief refinance same servicer loans. So they do not allow you to use LP for those loans. Those loans have to be manually underwritten. Okay, getting back to underwriting. Funds to close, does that need to be verified? Can they be rolled back into the loan or can the borrower get cash back? The, the borrower, in all cases, cannot get more than $250 cash back. So at the end of the day, you can roll cost into the loan. Again, remember, there's a difference between Fannie and Freddie. Fannie will let you roll all the costs into the loan. There's really no limit that applies there. In the case of Freddie Mac, there certainly is a limit, and that limit is 4% of the loan amount or $5,000, the lower of the two, not the greater, but the lower of the two. So a smaller loan amount, you got to be really careful because in many cases, those borrowers may end up having to have cash at closing to get the deal done. So then would you have to verify their bank accounts? In all honesty, I'll tell you, in most cases, most underwriters are going to make you. Um, you know, the technical answer is in, in most cases, if it's a current servicer, you quote unquote technically don't have to, uh, but you know, in practicality, I think you're going to find most underwriters are going to force you to. How about cash reserves? Uh, well, there's typically no reserves required as part of these deals. Dan, is subordinate financing allowed with this program? Yes. The borrower has subordinate financing in place. They can they can subordinate that, put it behind the loan that they currently have. What they typically cannot do is get new subordinate financing. So in other words, let's say they don't have any money to cover their closing costs. 
they're going to take out a second mortgage as part of what they're doing, then you, you can't do that. But if you have a home equity loan that's in place now, you can resubordinate that loan behind the new mortgage, uh, and, and you're fine to do that. There, there is typically no cap to the total loan to value first and second mortgage. Now, the one exception to that is Freddie Mac's rule. If the LTV on the first mortgage is less than 80%, then your total combined loan to value cannot exceed 105%. That is a Freddie only rule, and it only applies to loans where the LTV is less than 80%. And there are also, uh, just, just for everybody else out there who has not done this before, there are certain steps that you have to take when you subordinate a loan for Fannie and Freddie that you have to provide documentation to the underwriter to make sure that it's legal, it's correct, and that it will show up as a subordinated loan when the loan closes. Correct, Dan? Correct, yep. You know, in many cases, an underwriter is going to want a copy of the note for the second mortgage. In addition to that, you're going to have a, a formal subordination agreement that in many cases the underwriter is going to want proof that the, the other lender has agreed to, that it's something that can be recorded, and that a title company is going to accept it. So and, and, and let's not make this too, uh, let's, let's not overlook the fact that, quite frankly, the other lender has to be willing to subordinate the loan, too. You know, in some cases, we run into this where you have some lenders as foolish as it sounds, where they don't want to subordinate the loan because the value of the property is going down. You know, I personally don't understand the logic behind that because you not supporting the loan certainly doesn't make the process any easier for the borrower to repay you. But you do run into that from time to time. A little tip that we've had some success with uh, when we to that, and believe it or not, the, the challenges with that we typically run into are with small credit unions where they don't want to resubordinate the, the loan to the new deal. So normally what will happen is we'll coach the borrower on how to work through you know, the management team at the credit union to, to really become the squeaky wheel and get it done. And if they don't do that, uh, then we actually will coach the borrower on how to file a complaint with uh, federal, uh, the federal regulator for that agency or that institution. And uh, we've done that more than once mm -hmm. and have gotten them to, to subordinate the deal. So. You know, sometimes it's not easy. You know, I guess my, my, my point to be made here, sometimes it's not always easy to get the other lender to support me. We've had questions about that as well. So let's talk about also, I understand that non-owner occupied investment properties are part of this, which is another niche that loan officers can look, look yeah. to as far as, you know, the HARP 2.0 program. So could you go a little bit, give us a little information about that? You bet. You know, one of the things that a lot of times people don't realize is something that's a second home or it's investment property is eligible. And that could be a property that once was the borrower's primary residence and now has become a rental property because they moved or they, they did something different. Uh, in those cases, those properties are now, let's say, an investment property. Those loans are eligible under HARP. One of the big things, and this is something that uh, a lot of people don't realize, let's just say borrower has 50 loans uh, or 50 homes financed, and he has four or five Freddie and Fannie loans. Even though those number of homes financed exceeds Fannie Mae's current limits or Freddie Mac's current, current limits for investment property, those loans are eligible for HARP because they're currently owned by Freddie and Fannie. So there, and there are a ton of these people out there. I can tell you that I've done... HARP deals for countless people who own multiple properties. It is not uncommon to do three, four, five properties at a time for these borrowers because they have that many. Uh, so those people are out there, and in all honesty, oftentimes they're not getting helped by their current lender because their current lender doesn't understand that these can be done. Keep in mind, investment property, and in some cases second home, do not have the benefit of lower loan level price adjustments those properties still have the same caps in place in many cases uh, as part of the deal. Which brings up another question about overlays. Yep. Uh, I know I, I've heard <laughs> from some loan officers that lenders are putting overlays on a program that's supposed to be easy to implement. Uh, can, can you give a little background about that? Because I thought that they were going to be easier, in, in fact, reading their bulletin and the announcement, that they were going to be easier on buybacks on these types of loans versus the versus the traditional loans yep. that are sold to them. 
it, it's it's a good talking point, but in reality, you know, there is still risk for lenders, uh, and, and I think it's important for our our listeners to understand that that you know the name of the game, you know, in, in our industry has really changed. For now, you have a lot of lenders looking to mitigate or limit the amount of risk they have, and I can tell you that our institution has been forced to buy back HARP deals. And when you buy back a 110% LTV loan that now you're holding on your books, you start to think twice about whether or not you want to be too flexible with these deals. So, you know, there's there's what the agencies put out there and say, and then there's the real world of what happens in, behind the scenes that oftentimes we on the origination side don't necessarily see. Now, in, in my case, because I'm an originating manager, I see a little bit more than the average originator. And so when the agencies say, yep, you know, we're going to relieve the lender of this, that, that, and the other thing, and as somebody who has done a lot of writing for mortgage currency and has, has gone through that selling guide a million times, I can tell you that there are times where, where Feeney will say something, but then in different parts of their selling guide, they contradict themselves. And, you know, and so what you do is you try to manage to the least amount of risk. So I do think that even though the program is intended to be, you know, more flexible and leave lenders with less risk, I do think at the end of the day that you're still going to see a number of investors and lenders who say, we're willing to do these deals, but we're going to put our own overlays on them. And I know in the underwriting guidelines that came out that it that both Fannie and Freddie said that, quote, unquote, you're supposed to ignore bankruptcies and foreclosures. It shouldn't have an effect on that. But that would be almost considered an overlay, right? Yeah, yeah. When you look at, you know, you know Fannie in particular came out and said, hey, you don't have to follow our, our bankruptcy and foreclosure policy. Well, you know, when you're not the current servicer of that loan and you've got a borrower who's, you know, bruised, beat up, at the end of the day, you perceive to have a certain amount of risk. You know, at the end of the day, you may not be so willing to take that borrower on as a risk uh, because even though they may not default, they may become, you know, a collection problem. You know, you're going to expend resources trying to collect on this borrower. You know, when you start to look at it from a perspective different than a loan officer, you can start to see reasons why I don't want somebody else's problem. When I look at it as a lender, you know, and, and again, I get the benefit of wearing a couple of different hats here. When I look at it as, as a lender who, who still deals with clients, I want to write every loan I can. It's eligible. Why can't I do it? But then when I start to look at it from the management perspective, I can start to see reasons why I don't want to take that client in the door because he may end up becoming a problem or a risk that I prefer to avoid. And when there's times like now where there's enough business out there, you know, a lot of institutions say, well, why, why bother? You know, why, let's just cherry pick and take the easy stuff. So overall, loan officer th- yeah, has a, a borrower coming in, wants to do a HARP deal, but instead of them, you know, like try, beating a dead horse and, you know, knowing these uh, lender overlays, all those types of things, what do you recommend that loan officers do to make sure and, and, and there's no way to make sure, but to have a reasonable insurance that that loan is going to, to go through. Well, you know, the, the one thing I'll tell you is, you know, you've got resources like mortgage currency that are available to you so that you can keep up with everything that's changing. So if you are going to perform at a high level in this industry, you have to stay vested in your, your amount of knowledge. And there's there's probably never been a time where that's more important than now just because, the rules and guidelines and what it takes to get a deal done, you've got to know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing and you understand what the limitations in your product are and so on, then you can communicate effectively to your client. You can set the right expectations. And quite frankly, you get to know when to say no. And there are some times where, you know, you're going to have a certain amount of transactions that just can't be done. If there's one thing, you know, and for those of you who are listening, you know, I've got, uh, gosh, 20, 20 years in this industry. And there's, there, there's one thing I've gotten a lot better at within the course of the last year is saying no. You know, that doesn't make me any money. The quicker that I can determine that they can't be done, the less time and energy I'm going to spend with that client, and I'm going to move on to something that's going to, going to be productive. You know, so it's one of those things you, you, want to, you want to know what you're doing. You've got to invest the time in reading guidelines, stuff like mortgage currency, looking at your MI company's guidelines, and, and knowing the limitations of your investors. And, and know when to say when. And, and some clients, you know, they don't want to hear no. But, you know, the truth is that that's the answer. There's mm-hmm. nothing you can do different. Mm-hmm. 
and the more time that you have, the, the time that you spend saying no, you have more time to market and say yes to other yes. people who qualify. Uh, absolutely, you you don't have the time to putz around with somebody that you can't get done. Uh, you know, cut them loose faster and move on to the next one. You know, you, of course, you need to do it in a professional way where you can hopefully give them a little bit of guidance on what they need to do to be in a position to get something done down the road. Given all the changes that we've seen in the last year, the compensation and everything else, and the amount of work that goes into getting the deal done, we've got to be that much more efficient and that much better at what we're doing so that we're getting the most out of our time and, quite frankly, we're as efficient as possible. So just to wrap things up, here's a couple of links for you to follow Fannie and Freddie and the questions being asked of them when it comes to HARP. What I've noticed is that Fannie Mae updates their FAQs on a regular basis and they also date it when it's updated. So they've changed it just about a month ago. Uh, there were 30 questions that were on Fannie Mae's website. Now there are exactly 100. As for Freddie, I can tell that they're updating them, but they don't indicate which ones have been updated, and there is not a date that appears on that website page. My personal opinion is that there will be a few more updates to HARP before it's released to everyone in March.